I Want to Jump Like Didi with me, Charles Sibold, is the music podcast that does music a bit differently. I'm talking to some incredible musicians, DJs, and producers about how they use an experimental mindset to fuel their own creativity, pursue new challenges, overcome fears, bounce back from mistakes. Okay, so I, I really love the idea and the reality of, of DJ food. I mean, essentially, it's a you know sort of project that started back in 1990 when the uh, Colcus Innovation Lab, and that's when you know innovation labs were actually innovation labs. You know, not not a sort of phrase that's been hijacked by you know sort of corporates. Um, and they started producing these sort of collection of uh, breaks, beats, loops, and, and and samples, which were ideal for remixing, mixing and producing, as well as, you know, actually sort of home and dance floor cuts. Um, the project then sort of attracted like-minded collaborators and eventually the um, the mantle of DJ food was passed into the hands of one of the continually most inventive and experimental DJs of the past 30 years. So it's a, it's a real honor to welcome Strictly Kev to I Want to Jump Like DD. Kev, welcome. Welcome. Hello. That's a very interesting intro. I mean, uh, not quite <laughs> described in those glowing terms before, but well, absolutely. I mean, I mean if you f- feel free, if you want to, if you want to sort of correct yeah. me on any any yeah. parts of my probably rather amateurish research. No, no, no that's <laughs> that, that's great. Um, you know, I can't take all the credit. Uh, you know, the mantle was passed to myself and PC Patrick Carpenter for a good yeah. few years in the mid nineties mm. from from Matt and John, aka yeah. Conrad. So. You know, and he and he was part of the food thing, and, and still, you know, I still did work for him with him, yeah, you know, occasionally. So, you know, he, he went off to do his thing with Cinematic Orchestra in the early noughties, and then it sort of me, you know, after telling everybody that it wasn't a, a singular person, it was a collective. Suddenly, it's a singular person again. So, and back to square one. But so, I, I, but you know, I've sort of held that name for roughly twenty years now. So. Yeah. I mean, just maybe for, for 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 those that that sort of don't know as much about the, you know, the kind of the concept and the, you know, you know, kind of, I guess the kind of the reality now about about DJ food. Mm. I mean, uh, you know, it's hugely sort of popular. But just for those that don't, maybe just just want to kind of touch on that. Well, a, a quick pricey of it is, I mean, it's thirty years old now. Thirty. Mm. 31 maybe, uh, it started out as food for DJs. That's literally what it was. Yeah, um, Matt yeah. and John and co cut making breaks and beats for DJs. The idea being that there weren't any really good break beat sampling compilations out for DJs to cut up mm. back in the early 90s. Um, so they made the Jazz Break series, which were you know pretty sample heavy for the most part, but over five volumes got progressively more musical yeah. artistic um and matt and john were joined by patrick who i mentioned earlier and myself who are at the end uh mm. their program paul brook and um come sort of 95 and we were making rescue the disaster which was essentially the sixth jazz break yeah suggested that basically it's sort of outgrown the volume thing mm. it was more of an artist led thing even though it was a collective. yeah so we so we changed the name. It wasn't Jazz Breaks Volume Six. It was a rest of a disaster. And Patrick and I went out DJing on four turntables as DJ Food. Mm. And John were doing cold cut. You know, mm. um, that's the sort of rough pricey of it. But then mm. over the over the years, Patrick went on to do other things and sort of left me with the name. And I've just carried on yeah, making progress, not making less <laughs> music than than they did in in the first sort of six years over the last 20 but doing many yeah. many other things you know. yeah yeah i mean I, I mean how have you sort of seen the um you, you know kind of like the the sort of the 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 industry or the the kind of the role sort of evolve over over that over that time oh god that's that's i mean like anything you know 20 years ago was it 20 years no 30 years 30 now. yes 30 I know, years it's I mean, frightening isn't you know it? The music, nothing stays the same. Everything is moving mm. the whole time, whether you like it or not, whether whether you feel you're moving or not. Um, the, you know, the industry has changed hugely in the last 15 years. Well, maybe maybe the first 10 years were the more stable, you know, the, the, you yeah. know, the, the wonder years of, the last wonder years of vinyl before mm. the internet and the internet crept in and mm. uh, file sharing basically decimated the, the, the record, record record industry and 
I'd say that took roughly 10 years to stabilize. You know, Ninja yeah. weathered that storm quite well, but quite a few went under. You know, things just nosedived in the middle of the mm. I thought the label was even done for at one point because it, it was just no one was buying any records. You know, everyone was getting yeah. free. Final was dead, <laughs> you know, yeah. before Record Store Day, this is. Um, you know, uh, and the very everything was going digital even djing went digital you know i yeah. I, I, I cottoned on to serato in 2005 so i've been using that uh, that for over 15 years which is a yeah digital djing system and i kind of ditched the vinyl put that away for a good while yeah uh, went, went digital added video via the digital you know it's, it's the progression of of technology is what drives everything yeah, and that's really what pushes all, all industries, not just music, film, yeah. you name it. And and conversely, things coming back round into favour, uh, mm. and fashion like vinyl, for instance, you know, it's obviously come back into vinyl, uh, in fashion. Sorry, um, you know, massively over the last decade as well. Mm. I really thought at the end of say like when two thousand nine, I thought mm. it's dead in the water, you know. Mm. I don't really be able to press anything anymore, <laughs> you know. But, yeah, you know. Th but things happen. Reactions happen. Record store day is obviously a huge one, you know, yeah. which is basically breathed new life into vinyl, which is giving it to a new generation. But I guess that yeah, you sort of touched on some interesting things there. You know, the the, the sort of the, the, this sort of industry, to, you know, technology has played plays such a huge part, and it's sort of it, it's so it's so quick, um, and 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 also. The other, the other thing is that, you know, kind of, you know, people's behaviors are, are changing as well. You know, it's that that's really sort of impacting. I remember like, you know, kind of when, oh, it must be, must have been sort of Napster in, what was that sort of 99 or something? Something like that, yeah. Round about that. Sort of, maybe. No, uh, yeah. was, Napster was like 2001, I think. Was it? 2000. Yeah, some, something around there. And, and but the, you know the effect of it is it sort of it, it I I thought that that really sort of changed behaviors because then it's almost like opening up this world of like well you can kind of get it for free it's it gets that sort of mindset mindset mm -hmm. sort of shift so you've got technology that's that's kind of driving you know sort of driving the way that you do things uh, differently but also you've got you know people who are you know your consumers i suppose that and their, their behaviors are changing because expectations are totally different as well well it was a bit like the beginning of the 90s when um you know studio equipment got more affordable so suddenly mm. you you know, making music wasn't the preserve of the people who could afford to rent a studio or, yeah. or buy that stuff so you got mm. veteran production and you got dance music really really you know coming into its own with with mm. people like apex twin and prodigy and and, and and everyone really you know myself yeah. included you know, and then I think what happened with with the internet was it it completely toppled those old, you know, gods. You know, I remember yeah. Metallica getting interviewed a lot because yeah. they were pissed off that they weren't, you know, yeah. making any money, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it 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 literally gave the person, the the kid in their bedroom, you mm. know, who didn't really have any experience, you know, the the ability to put stuff out, not only make stuff. Um, yeah. But to put it on the web, you know, a, bit, yeah. a little, little bit later than 2000, obviously, because you had, when did YouTube start? 2003 or something like 2003, that? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. But I was really heavily involved in the sort of bastard pop mashup craze at the beginning of the noughties because it really, really, it spoke to me on, on multiple levels as in that I was doing that as a DJ anyway, you know, putting mm. records together to make a third and it was fun and it was a good party. And, you know, I, I, you know, I did a load of that stuff for a few years and it was a good, yeah. uh, but met a bunch of good people who I still know to this day. Mm. Um, you know, that, that thing's kind of gone by the wayside now, but it, all those people were just guys and girls in their bedroom putting stuff up you mm. know, in terrible quality MP3s. There was this one kid called the doctor who was a, literally a school kid in manchester who was 14 who used to run this site putting selection from his mm. bedroom mm. and he basically became the go-to guy to send all of these mashups to and he had the sort of the ear of um james hyman and eddie temple morris on xfm and they would kind of yeah. go to his site to get all the next mashups to play on xfm mm. you know the sort of the re the re-weighting of power through technology mm. 
there is, is quite incredible. I mean, he was mm. a quite extreme example, but I remember, I think he had to stop at 16 because basically it was getting so ridiculously popular that his parents just said, look, you've got exams, you've got to stop this. <laughs> he was just, you know, coming home from school and going on, on the internet all night and basically presiding over this kind of emporium of, of mashups. And, yeah. You know, because there was no, there were no records of it, of it out at that point and people were just chucking stuff up, doing it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I remember one, one, of, one of my other episodes when I was talking to Andrew Fern, um, and 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 he was because he 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 was doing that that kind of bedroom thing. I mean, I think he's still doing it now, but also you know, kind of back when he was a you know a teenager, mm. you know, back at the you know in the, sort of the late eighties, you know, doing that. And it was only I guess in the last sort of few years that he started to put out some of those tapes of the stuff that he was kind of creating then. And then at a, that that what, what, it must have been sort of eighty seven, I guess the justified ancients of moo moo mm. album um when that came out and that was just like wow yeah yeah i mean it's it's dated horrendously but yes you know, it's sometimes those experiments when it's the early days of something with early technology when there were no rules and there were no boundaries they're the most exciting interesting yeah. things because people haven't formulated what this is yet sometimes it doesn't even have a name yeah. and it's only when a journalist comes along picks up the disparate threads, puts them together and names it, that it kind yeah. of solidifies into a movement. And that it's almost when that's almost when its time is up. It's like the crystallization yeah. era is over. It's been pigeonholed. You know, that's and that's reason. not to say that nothing good comes out of that because, you know, great things came out of hip hop, drum and bass. But when yeah. when movements are sort of left to coalesce, and yeah. kind of form their own things. I find it really interesting. And the biggest example of that in the last maybe two decades is things like what you know, the sort of LA beat scene, the mm. Flying Lotus, you know, the Mad yeah. Lib, the Jay Dealer, you know, which is essentially somewhere pitched between hip hop and trip hop, but it's mm. never really been given a name. Mm. You know, the brain feeder crew, all that sort of stuff. And there's a million people produced 73. Mm. all those guys they're mixing in jazz they're mixing in hip-hop they're mixing in rock and funk and weird electronics and it's never really been kind of brought together and and named and as a result mm. it's flourished and it's and it's not been really defined and i find that really um you know enlightening it's, uh, it's interesting you, you mentioned that actually because I, I mean what one thing that is, is a bit of uh, i said yeah, a book bear probably is, which is which is about these these sort of labels, you know, and kind of genres, and I I, un I understand why why they exist, mm -hmm. you know. I think you know, just from a kind of human brain perspective, it helps us to compartmentalize things, which helps us to understand where it kind of sits in, you know, in, in our and, life, and for labels to sell it as well, and to sell it as well from a pure kind of commercial yeah. practical Absolutely. point of view. But you know, the one and. You know, nowadays there are so many kind of mixes of genres in whatever style of music you mm. you choose to listen to that mm. it does become almost impossible to put it in a in a or, and, and also almost pointless to put it into that one of those sort of categories because they, yeah. they, they almost feel a little bit redundant. And well, I think uses like you said. I mean, John Moore has got a good line in that he says, "I don't mind labels, but I." I'd like to add lots of them, please. You know, not just yeah. one. And, yeah. and and there's that whole thing where people expect you to do one thing, and if you don't do one thing and stick to that thing, mm. they 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 can't quite get it. Um, you know, yeah. there's a multitude of producers that produce in mega, you know, low, a massive range of styles. Tom um, uh, Mark Pritchard is a particularly good example mm. of someone who mm. really excels in so <laughs> many categories of dance music. He can pretty much turn his hand to anything. And yeah. you'll still have a signature sound that's very good at assimilating those things, you know. But you wouldn't say, "Oh, what, what music does Mark Pritchard make?" Well, yeah, you know, yeah, take your pick, sort of thing. Take your you pick, know? yeah, you know. And some people are just great at other things, and when uh, one thing, and then and when they try their hand at others, it doesn't really work. But that's, mm. that's down to the individual. I know. I mean, I come from a, an age of eclecticism in the hip hop, which was my sort of first big love up love after pop music mm. you know took liberally from everywhere and made this patchwork collage of, of yeah. sound which was then you know assimilated with 
not only the music, the, the art and the, the dance and the fashion and the, and the emceeing into this, this, yeah. this, this thing. And that's always been the sort of foundation for me as a DJ. And then, you know, resulting me a producer in that you take the best bits from everywhere and you make mm. what you make out of it. And, um, you know, that's what I still do to this day in, in mm. everything I do, not just DJing production or design work. You know, yeah. That's another sort of part of my sort of creative output. You know, because what you were saying earlier about that, um, you, you know, kind of like when things are, um, you know, at the very kind of early sort of nascent stage before it's kind of coalesced, I get, you know, into the and and, and formed is mm-hmm. the most exciting part, which you, you know, and, and I find myself sometimes, um, you know, kind of, you know, music or bands that I listen to, and and I, and I. I, I sometimes wonder if I, I'm not being a snob here, but it's it's like you know I hear a band you know and, and it's before they've got anywhere you know it's sort of very early days and I think oh, this is fantastic it's so kind of raw and new and it's it's kind of exciting and then the popularity starts to grow and it's like my interests starts to sort of wane a little bit. I know I know what you mean. We're all we're all victims of that a little bit, aren't we? But for me, it's when when there becomes a formula and you can predict the formula, mm. you can you know some artists or bands they find their formula they know what's successful and then they repeat it and they don't really mm. go out on the edge and, and yeah and, um and of course as well as long as you know the longer a band's career is every new release you're referring back to the piece before aren't you because you've yeah you've got a frame of reference you've got a frame them, of reference you know? and yeah. and so i think there's a little bit of that that goes on whether you like it or not Mm. There are very few artists that really do push themselves and go out, you know, break the formula. People like Beck do it all the time. Radiohead have done it. You know, they've yeah. done it. Um, you know, there are people, Bjork as well. You know, but, yeah. But then you find yourself having, are, are you going with that artist or are you preferring the stuff when they didn't break the formula? You know, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's all, everyone's different, aren't they? I guess yeah. I guess that, that that's where you know, kind of bands face criticism or or like, oh, I just wish they would do the same thing. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like sort of repetitive. I mean, from a from I guess from the from the band's point of view, and I'm I'm, I'm interested in this from from your point of view, is your perspective, your own perspective. You know, kind of like when when you were sort of growing up, about you you know how this sort of came about, because like from a, I, you know, doing the same thing repetitively for mm-hmm. over. You know, I don't know, like twenty years. I mean, yeah, I can't do that. Tires, a bit tiresome. You know, I can't. I, I, I hate. I, I get really, really itchy feet if I have to do something that I've already done before. I'm constantly looking for something new or a mm. new way to do something. I'm really turned off by cliche. Yeah. Um, and whenever someone gives me an i uh, a project, let's say, it could be anything from music remix, DJ mix, or a or, or, or a graphic design job. Yeah. I'm always looking at it from, I first of all have a frame of reference. I run through all the things that I've seen before that could fit this concept. Yeah. And I throw them all away because I don't want to knowingly repeat what someone else has done. And yeah. I also don't yeah. want to knowingly repeat what I've done unless that's being asked for. And even then, I want to do it differently. And also, we do do things differently. You know, we, we change, as I said, we're always changing, everything's changing. I'm not the person I was even five years ago, let alone yeah. 10, 15, 20, 30, mm-hmm. you know, and music certainly isn't, technology isn't, you know, the, mm. the place that we are in our lives isn't, you know. Mm. Um, you know, I'm a totally different person than I was in the 90s, which is mm. DJ Food, the name was the biggest. Mm. And to, sort of, to try and repeat that would be pointless because also you've got people's memories of that era and time attached. Yeah to yeah. that thing and i think there's a lot there's a, there's a mistake that some people make is to go down that nostalgia route mm. and i'm a big fan of nostalgia up yeah to point. but yeah. to try to recapture that is going to be virtually pointless unless you've yeah. got something from back in that era which <laughs> didn't ever get put out because yeah. everything's moved on and you know um i'm kind of more interested in doing the thing that i'm at where i'm at now you know yeah uh, and pushing on with that 
that, that because in 20 years time that'll have the residual memories that are associated with this era and this time mm. sometimes people don't see the the wider picture the, 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 they don't play the long game you know but what we i mean i mean th- I mean, this is this is like I, I mean, I love this because it's like a, it's such a kind of progressive, you know, sort of mindset. Because I think I think that you know, as we, as we get older, it's very easy to sort of slide back into that into that sort of nostalgia thing. Because you, you know, that's I guess that's how our memories memories sort of work. But you, you know, kind of what what you know, look at looking back on on your life to your sort of early days when you were growing up. What what kind of were the, were your kind of influences that that you, you know sort of formed. Who ha- formed? I guess how your how you shifted your identity through the years. Um, well, I always drew as a kid, so comics were a huge early influence artistically for me. Yeah. And then I I got into pop music in um, I'm really really heavily in when I was ten, like nineteen eighty, and yeah, my first big sort of love as a pop group was Adam and the Ants with their good friend. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. With the, the original. Yeah. Um, Punk lineup, obviously, which yeah. I found via, I, you know, I got into the doggy dog, Kings of Our Frontier era, Absolutely. Adam and the Ants. Yeah. And yeah. found that was what sucks. You know, Same for me. There. Yeah. Um, which is arguably aged better. Although yes. I do still love that stuff, you know, the, the pirate era. Yeah. And then, but, and then, you know, got into the whole electronic synth wave, Gary Newman, Human League, all that sort of stuff, mm. Duran Duran, Japan. Mm. Um, era of pop music before Frankie, Art of Noise, Trevor yeah. Horn, and ZTT arrived in 1984 and just blew my mind. Yeah, and that for me was the peak of pop music for me. After that, nothing, nothing came up to par, and I discovered hip hop. I'm, I'm interested in that. What, what was it that, that you know about that sort of Frankie era that you know that that, that you know kind of Art of Noise that really you know kind of blew your mind? What was it that well, it was a combination of several things. Um, obviously, I first heard Frankie's Relax, and it yeah. absolutely floored me. I was just like, this is perfect pop music. You know, it's yeah. really one of the perfect, perfect pop songs of the 80s. Following it up with Two Triumphs, which was even better, yeah. arguably, you know, more yeah. expansive with all the remixes. Yeah. Immediately cotton on with the remixes. The sleeve art was hugely influential, though I wouldn't realise it until years later. And... Mm. Um, you know, the art of noise with the sampling. Mm. You know, I was working my way towards that era with, mm. with hip hop. Uh, um, you know, and obviously Malcolm McLaren has created Duck Rock with Trevor Horn a few years before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was all percolating and bubbling in the same timelines, you know. Mm. Got into the Pleasure Dome, you know, the, the track from the Frankie album, the, the sidelong first track, which to me is a masterpiece of. Of yeah. everything production writing orchestration mm. you name it it's just got everything it's almost mm. down downhill after that for the album you know <laughs> they, they blew their wag on the first track but it didn't really matter um, yeah and after that you know i mean you probably remember but in the 80s post well the pleasure dome it was live aid yeah and it was stock acting and waterman's death yeah. until yeah. until you know dance music really it's head at the end of the 80s yeah. so i just dived into hip hop because that was kind of bubbling on with the electric remember the electro compilations on street wave they were they were hugely yeah. influential to me and my friends in the 80s because it was affordable you know compilations mm. of unaffordable american imports and i used to listen to the radio tape hip hop basically that le- that taught me to dj i listened to I taught myself to dj in 85 um wanting to scratch basically and mm. didn't really have any production you know, um, wishes. I just wanted to learn how to DJ, collect records, find samples. Mm. You know, all that sort of thing. And 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 hip hop. I I would say was a was a big education for me from probably f- the age of fifteen to twenty. Mm. In that, it opened me up to so much music through the samples. It, it opened me up to mm. funk and jazz and, and soul and bits of rock and Latin and all sorts of things that I didn't know anything about. Really, yeah. and it, it brought it brought it, it it widened the scope from pop music out into the wider world, and um and I, at the same time I was I was doing graffiti and I was you know I was really yeah. immersed in that culture. I was going to gigs and and, and painting walls and you know that was my art out there. Was, was yeah, 
Was that was that kind of like the the, the sort of the the New York scene? Because I, I mean, I like from like for me, for example, I know I mean sim, similar similar sort of thing. My 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 first love was punk rock and the kind of hardcore stuff, and um, you know, Ramones was my first love, then Black Flag and Bad Brain stuff like that. And it was it was it was I, I remember it was Public Enemies' first album when that came out. That that was I think before then I was I was quite tunnel vision, mm. you know, as to what I like. And and it was it was uh, Public Enemies' first album when that came out. I was just like, wow, mm. this is you know just kind of sonically, yeah. It was it, it I think sonically it kind of fitted in with what I liked because it, it, it was it was it was taut. It was it's quite it was raw very, as well. There's a lot yeah. of rage and power there. And Absolutely. I, I, you know, Run DMC and, and um, Beastie Boys mm. and Rick Rubin had kind of quite hand-fistedly tried to marry rock and rap, and it didn't really yeah. work. It was it yeah. was kind of tokenism, wasn't it, really? It's like an mm. amazing bit here and there. But when you listen to the noise of Public Enemy, it had that power that something like Rollins Band would have, yeah. you know, that grit and that rage. And, yeah. and I think that really helped. Bring mm. labor. It wasn't. It wasn't kind of commercial either. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, it, was, it, it spoke to a lot of people, but it wasn't all this way like Run DMC and Aerosmith. Yeah, I mean, I did. I did, I did like that that sort of era of of hip hop, and 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 that that and Public Enemy then sort of turned me on to you know Eric B and Rakim, mm. um, and, and 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 you mentioned earlier about sort of remixes. Um, and in fact, I think I think Cole did a remix, didn't it? That, that, very that Rakim, yeah. a very big Rakim, which was just phenomenal. I it mean, was. totally sort of phenomenal. Those sort of seven minutes of just like it, like incredible. It basically, reinvented the, what the remix could be. Up until yeah. that point, the remix had been on a twelve-inch, maybe an extended intro and extended middle eight. Yeah. And then when they came along and did that, it was okay. All bets are off now. We can yeah. completely remake this thing into something completely different. And there were quite a lot of copycats afterwards. Yeah. In the whole sort of, this is a journey, so, you know. Yes, exactly. Yeah, mm. that's the one. It was, it, you know, they opened the door to a lot of people. And, and I, you know, them, Bomb the Bass, Mars, we pump up the volume, S Express, all those kind mm. of masters, they really, they really did it you know, a good service for UK production, I think, uh, yeah. and got the charts while they were at it. Did that, did that, like, do you think that that gave you, or, um, you, you know, the, um, I guess sort of thinking that, okay, well, this opens the door to doing anything, to reshaping song, to, you know, to essentially what remixing became? A little bit, yeah. I mean, I, I always go back to the, um, the first time I heard The Lessons by Double D and Steinsky, the mega mm. um from the early 80s i understood immediately how they were made because i could deconstruct them sonically because i could yeah. hear all the different component parts yeah and when i heard people like cold cut and and bomb the bass i could do exactly the same and that's expressed you know you could hear the samples oh there's a bit of rose royce there's a bit of james brown you know there's a bit of your Thunderbird sort of shaft or something like that. You know, it wasn't, it, they weren't stealing from, you know, completely unknown sources. It was, they were quite liberally taking, as everyone does, again, in the middle, in the, the beginning of a, of a sort of new scene, you take liberally from what's right in front of you and then you dig a di bit deeper a bit later. And, and it, I, I, w I was never musical. I tried mm. to play guitar and it wasn't for me. Mm. Um, but I could immediately tune in to hip hop because I could hear mm. the samples and I could I, I could get a turntable and I could scratch with it. And I could get another turntable and mix with it. You know, it was, yeah. it was uh, again, the technology was was being appropriated by a subculture to do something it wasn't made to do, you know, two mm. times in a mixer, scratching a record, which you were never meant to do, you know. Yeah. And 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 the, the you know, the next generation were pushing it in some way. To make something else and i was mm. definitely you know that that spoke to me did, did you with, with not i guess sort of having that musical sort of sort of background or, or training if you will did, did that mean that you, you sort of really went from your instinct when you kind of hearing things and how to sort of put things together i suppose so yeah i mean i knew what i liked so um, 
you know, I would go to car boot sales and, and charity shops and I would buy records usually based on the cover art because they looked like they would be a good mm. funky record, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, pre-internet, all that, blah, blah, blah. You know, you had to you had to rely on instincts and, and the minimal amount of information that you could glean from either a TV show or a, or a radio show or a magazine. Mm. Um, and, you know, I would listen through a double album of Parliament Live and I would find the drum break and I would, you know, record it onto tape and put it into a mix and, and do all that sort of stuff. And, you know, you were trying to be like the people you heard on the records. You know, I would, I would literally learn how to scratch by listening to somebody scratching on, let's say, a, wow. a, you know, a DJ Cheese record, and I would copy the scratches until I got it right. And that was, wow. that was how you did it. You know, there were no videos to say, here's how to scratch. <laughs> <laughs> wow that's that's really that's really incredible you know sort of d d you know d doing that and and i guess it's a you, you know it's a d different a, an, another way of of um of, of creating of you, you know looking at what other people are doing and saying oh, okay i can i can sort of do that it's, it's mm. almost like that that kind of punk ethic if you will mm. that i can, yeah, I mean, I can we do all, we all learn by right. imitation don't we yeah and then trial and error within that and you know what you you end up with something good or oh, that's not so good you know mm. but there were never really any sort of um it was always a hobby you know it was never thinking oh i'm going to be a producer i wanted to be mm. a dj i wanted mm. to be a scratch dj and that was about the extent of it and i would do parties with my friends and and you know little things and mess about in my bedroom with making tapes and stuff but of course, in the 90s, things changed, you know, largely as a result of, with, with people like Matt and John and Coca and the dance music yeah. growing and, and being. And I always liked the DJing because it was kind of, you were kind of anonymous. You were at the back with hip hop. Mm. The DJ was, wasn't really the star. Maybe a couple of times he was the star. But, you know, you largely, the MCs were out the front. The DJ stuck to the back. And that was fine by me because I was quite shy. So... Yeah. Of course, that all changed in the nineties when the superstar DJ came along, and DJs were now on the stage. On the stage, yeah, it was it's like of, shit. How am I going to deal with this? Backfired slightly on that <laughs> one, but you know, but with that came the ability to make a living, which almost sort of came as a result of of the times changing and me being in the right place at the right time. You know, meeting Matt and John after I went, I moved to London in um, nineteen ninety. Yeah, to study graphic design in Camberwell. And then at the, at the end of that, met Matt and John because I was holding parties with my friends. And mm. um, we knew Mixed Master Morris, who put me in touch with Matt yeah. Black, who came yeah. to DJ some of our earliest parties, which was yeah. set a chain of events in motion through things that I was doing with my friends. And, you know, one thing led to another, and I got a foot on the ladder and yeah. climbed the ladder over the last 20, 30 years. So I guess I mean I mean you know those, those sort of scenes that you you started hanging out in and I guess sort of moving to London. I mean moving to London was that was that a sort of um, you know like a deliberate move to 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 try and get into that that no, scene, well a, a particular scene. It was two things. Um, I wanted to. Um, I thought I was going to do art, some form of art for my living. So I went mm. to study graphic. I went to study illustration actually at Canberra. Okay, and mid mid uh, course I changed to graphic design because it was pointed out to me that my graphic design skills were stronger than my illustration and mm. I grudgingly changed and that was you know they knew what they were talking about basically mm. but the whole time I, I come from a small town in in Surrey called Rygate which mm. is about 30 miles south of here but you know there's not nothing happening mm. you know, it's coming up to London from you know mid 80s to kind of check out graffiti and and, go yeah. and and all that sort of stuff and i immediately knew that this was the place for me i didn't really yeah. want to stay in surrey you mm. know london was calling and the, the the breadth of culture that was here yeah. that was just completely unavailable to me in my mm. hometown was it was a no-brainer it was like mm. you know, where do you want to go and study well london you know and i was lucky enough to get in um and you know, you come to the city and you just soak it up and it's, and I was a, a big sponge. And, uh, you know, by the time I'd left 
college, I had an idea of what I wanted to do in art. I had a direction. I, I was doing stuff with friends. I was living with, putting on parties, and just was very, very lucky to be in the right places, in the right times, meeting the right people with the right skills mm. to, you know, to kind of get on. And you know, I had a, I had a, I had a job in a bookshop, and I was, but I was, I'd go from the bookshop to down to. Um, heaven and dj sort of thursday nights and stuff in the back room literally yeah. take my record box to work on the bus yeah. go do a whole day's work go down the road literally carrying it have a slice of pizza for dinner and then dj till two in the morning get the night bus home you know wow. I mean, how the body does that and then go to work yeah. the next day as well you know crazy and probably, probably djing for like 50 quid or something as well yeah but you know you do these things when you're that age because you you don't know any better mm. and you along the way you meet people and you make the contacts and, and then if mm. you've got the skills and you know people ask you back then you know you get on don't you? you just you just do it and you don't even think about it most of it i was doing it because somebody asked me to dj i was like great I want, i'm djing in a london club great you know yeah wow you know? and then production came on later because as a result of meeting matt and john and being around ninja tune mm. i was asked to contribute first to the radio show solid steel then things like the journeys by dj mix that cold cup did then mm. because i was in a studio situation i was asked to come and bring ideas into the studio and, and you know gradually you know mm. learn my way around that sort of thing well i'd say gradually i, I still don't know that much you know compared to some i, I think it's I, I mean it's really i mean it sounds very very sort of obvious that you surround yourself with people you you know that you you know that you can learn from that are sort of like like-minded I mean, it sounds very obvious, but it's not always easy easy to do. You... Well, no, I mean, it was completely impossible where I was living. You know, mm. sorry, um, I had a group of maybe three or four friends who were like minded, who were either DJs or graffiti artists. Yeah, and they were scattered either in the next town or the next town, but one over. And it was cool, but you know, you you went to London and you would go to gigs and you would see all these people, and they'd all yeah. come from the outskirts and they'd all come in. And there's this whole thing about finding your tribe. You know, you must have heard that cliche mm. a million times. And mm. that's when you come to London, it's easier to find a tribe and rather than yeah. like a tiny little, you know, handful of people. You, you will yeah. literally find, um, you know, a, a room full of people like you and you can whittle it down to the, you know, hone into the ones you can collaborate with. And, yeah. You know, you're really up tuning in the wavelength almost like it's like tuning in the radio, you know, you, yeah. you're scrolling along till you find that station that really speaks to you. Yeah. And in London, just for the sheer size and breadth of it and the multiculturalism, you're just going to run into people that are, you know, mm. on that wavelength. I guess, and I guess that, you know, the, yeah, the, the, the city, the, you know, the environment and then, you know, going even more sort of forensically, then you get the, you know, either the kind of the studios or the or the clubs where this the, where the music is sort of going on, and it's kind of I mean they're just like sort of fertile grounds, you know, that sort of attract people. I mean, that's yeah. the that's the real kind of beauty of it. There's a sort of relationship between the environment and people. Yeah, you know that 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 attract people who are kind of like just okay, we we hit it off. We're we're kind of right, and I guess in in, in what you've been doing, you know, sort of collaborations have been a big part of. You know sort of what you do as well yeah but go going back to that point as well you know at that point because in the early 90s um we still hadn't didn't have the internet mm. it was so much harder to find people true yeah they, you could probably <laughs> google you know a particular subject and there'll be a forum or a group or a facebook page associated yeah. with that and you just be able to plug in make yeah. friends from everywhere <laughs> and that just wasn't an option back then, you know, and as well, once I got my foot in the door and I was starting to travel as a course of DJing, I'd start to travel over the UK, mm. start seeing the bigger picture. And it's all about travel for me in, in terms of opening your eyes and opening your mind to what's out there. And I remember, you know, early gigs going out of the UK. I think I didn't, go out of the UK till I was probably 23 or something, you know, fly on a plane. Because mm. I just, you know, I didn't come from a family that used to have overseas holidays. We didn't have the money. Mm. And then going to places like America and Japan, mm. you know, and were just mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. 
seeing that all the little conventions that existed, let's say in London and in the UK music scene, and you know, being really, really plugged in. I thought I'm plugged into the to the music scene. I'm, I know what's going on in London. I know where the cool clubs are, and I know where who, who does this and where and that when that mm. label is. All those shops go to the states completely, completely. You know, another world and, and several other worlds. You know, you go from the east coast to the west coast, and they're different. You know, and and, yeah. and all the little states in between. You know, you've got you've got 50, 50 different bubbles there, and they don't know who you are. They don't care who you are. They don't even have a concept of what music you're making. It's because you know we were at the sort of avant-garde of a lot of that stuff mm. in London and exporting it over overseas. I mean, I'm interested that you, you mentioned earlier that, you, you, you know, about the sort of early days, pre kind of superstar DJs, that you were sort of quite happy because you, you were sort of on the shy side, which I was, well, you know, I still am. I still have that, you, you know, you never get rid of it. Um, but when you, when you think that, okay, I'm, I, I've overcome London, I've kind of, got in there and then i've got to do it all again in mm. in like these places they're doing some amazing stuff but i'm a kind of shy kid am i going to do that how did how did you adapt to that i just got on with it because i figured if someone's asked me to do something and be somewhere they think that i can do mm. and and it's my i've only got one chance to prove them wrong you know yeah so or prove them right so you know and it's that whole thing as i get older i get more confident because i've got experience you know I've yeah. got decades literally decades of experience and knowledge to draw yeah. on and even if someone now tells asked me to do something that i've never done before i'm far more likely to say yeah okay fine because i know that i'll be able to work it out somehow mm-hmm. and even if i don't uh, i can't or the or the results aren't maybe to 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 my sort of liking or standard yeah you've got to try that you know you've got yeah. to try that thing i would have shied away from certain things younger because i wouldn't have had the skills or the knowledge so i would yeah. rather not done it and not made the mistake than than maybe jumped in the deep end you know yeah. but there were but there were instances where i jumped in the deep end very much so with um uh with ninja tune when i sort of came to them with my design skills mm skills in work commons at that point you know in the sort of fresh out of college and they wanted you know they wanted a logo and they wanted them to look for the for the label and they wanted record sleeves i knew that i wanted to design for music i didn't necessarily know how to design for music because my course was a classic lateral thinking not practical application course so yeah i very much had to learn on the job um, and make my mistakes in public, but I was I could see that I was being given the chance to do that, so I literally jumped in the deep end and, and sort of sunk or swim, you know. And um, how, how, I mean, that's really fascinating. I mean, you know, when you when you jumped in, how how did you feel about doing that? Were you like kind of like as nervous as hell? And and then how did, how did it go? Well, there were several things at the time when I. Did my first designs for Ninja Tune, which was a sort of rebranding of the logo in '94. Mm. The label was still relatively unknown. It was, it mm. was very much, a, you know, they'd been around for four years, but they hadn't really had any big successes yet. Moax was kind of just coming into the spotlight, and it would be a good year before Ninja actually even got a look in after that. So yeah. I did have a little bit of time to make some mistakes in public, but um, I had to. First of all, ask the the the, um, the guy who, who um, ran Ninja at that time, Peter Quick, the manager. He had some, he had some experience from dealing with printers, so he would sort of give me some some tips, and I would ring the printers and I would mm. ask them this and that, and then I'd send in the artwork. And they'd invariably ring me back and go, "You haven't included this font, or there isn't a printer font with this, or this is all misregistered, or there what." what where are the layers in this file? Like I, I would yeah. for years and years, I didn't know about layers in, yeah. in desktop publishing. And it, it was such a revelation when somebody one day showed me layers. And I was layers. like, oh right, okay. <laughs> so this is how we do it. And there was, I always remember there was this one girl who worked at one of the printers that we used to use back in the day. And she was, she could sort of see that I was completely in over my head. And one day she gave me two CDRs and one was a load of apps 
that were cracked. And one was a ton of fonts, all with the printer fonts, because back in those days, you had the screen font and the printer font, font. They were separate. And she just said, look, have these. You know, you might these might be really helpful. I still actually have those CDRs. And they're, wow. they're you know, she didn't have to do that. You know, I didn't particularly have a rapport with her, but I think she saw me coming and going so much and was really struggling with the mechanics of getting the thing off of the desktop onto the printed page that she, you know, she really helped me out. Wow. So, you know, you've, got, you've got people that will help you. And if you're not too proud along the way to, to ask mm. for help as well, you know, which we all, we all have our sort of arrogant youth, you know, where we think that we know it all and we can we do it all. Rest of it. But, you know, you have to, you have to sometimes swallow your pride a little bit and, and, and ask for help and not, and it's not a bad thing. I guess it's interesting what you say about the, um, you know, almost sort of pre-internet and, and, and you, you're relying so much on, you know, your ability to build relationships. Mm, mm, you know, that, that kind of, good. like, you have to travel. I have to physically yeah. sort of go there, yeah. you know, to kind of do this. And it's and really important. And I've, I've said this before in interviews, and it's something that I've always remembered. Um, and don't be a dick. You know, treat mm. people, it doesn't matter who they are, yeah, treat yeah. people as you want to be treated because those people will remember and they'll be somewhere else in 20 years and they'll go, oh, yeah, I remember you when you came in and you were just this little guy and now I'm the head of this corporation or something. Do you want to do a job? <laughs> or, you know, or, or conversely, you were a dick to me. And, you know, yeah. you know if, you're good, if you're a DJ and you're going into a club, don't speak to the sound engineer. First of all, and, and and speak to the lighting engineer and, and 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 you know tell them what you want and say what what, what, what do I need to do here? You know, don't be a print donor and say where's my rider, you know, and where are the drugs or whatever. Yeah. Some people I think, are, you, you, they have that sort of sense of self-importance, and it's like go and speak to the people that are going to make you look and sound good. Yeah, I I, th I think uh, I mean you hit on a really good point. There. I I I'm a sort of massive believer in um you know sort of like emotion the importance of emotional intelligence especially sort of these days and, and in particular sort of empathy and seeing things from other people's perspectives but also mm. you know things like you know how you regulate yourself so you don't act like a dick and you don't you know say things without thinking yeah. you know because because it's it's harder these days to there are more opportunities to build relationships but also it's it's harder as well because people are communicating by by email a lot more rather than you know the sort of the face to face and things like that and th the opportunities for misinterpreting things is so yeah. easy uh, but we we shy you know we we all do it i'm sure you know shy away from picking the phone up and yeah. you know, and you know it's 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 really important and and also because i think because the world is so much more sort of complex in how it functions that you kind of need these it doesn't it's not as easy it's just not as easy yes definitely definitely it's, it's definitely i find as well with the email age you you maybe you form relationships less easily with people there's very few people mm. i think i know that purely through an email or a, let's say an mm. internet relationship you know that i still yeah. speak to you know that yeah. i haven't met in real life there, there might be a few but um you know mm. through um distance issues or you know being in different countries or whatever mm. but, yeah it's very i still find myself graduating back to gravitating sorry is the word um back to mm. people you know that i maybe i worked with 20 years ago you know, and there's, yeah. there's a connection there that was formed pre-internet, let's say, or maybe we, we did a lot more of the stuff traveling and, mm. you know, you've got a history there. Mm. Well, I guess, you know, also, so, you know, other people change, you know, as well as yourself changing, you know, other people changing, getting, they have their different experiences. So sort of going back to, you know, to somebody from that length, from that sort of time ago, yeah. you know to see how they've sort of changed and what else they've been been interested in i guess it's all sort of part of curiosity as well mm. you know sort of constantly sort of being being curious i mean and again you know from an innovation point of view and sort of you know what you're doing i mean that you know that curiosity seems to me something that you've got 
I've oh, always had that. Yes, I've always had that. I'm, yeah. always, I'm not sort of, I don't flip from one thing to another, but I need mm. stimulus. And that may come from any, you know, a sort of musical discovery or maybe a new musical movement that really I can really lock into. Yeah. Things a little fresh technologically, like um, I was saying before, you know, it went over to Serato in. 2005 which was the digital dj system yeah. after using vinyl and cd for well 20 years mm. and it really invigorated me i was kind of getting a little bit lost i was like i i can't do anything more with vinyl yeah. and i can see coke up doing you know their start starting of the audio visual sort of era but that wasn't for me at that point i wasn't ready to car a truckload of gear around with me to on tour mm. And there wasn't anything available that could do that video side. But a few years later, there was. So mm. I, I got, a, got a chance to sort of suddenly expand my record box tenfold, play all sorts of edits and unreleased and uncut music you know, off of a laptop and then mm. add video to it. And it just kept me, kept me, kept me fresh, you know, keeps you on your toes. And then, you know, the vinyl resurgence came back and I, I had an eye, uh, I got a, a asked by Bocker 45 from Bristol mm. to come up and play his night uh, 45 live up in Bristol. And he said, I'll oh, come up, you know, we, the only rule is you've got to bring seven inches on vinyl. You can't play anything else. And I was like, ah, oh, okay, that's interesting. That's a real challenge because not only mm. do I have to then go to my seven inch collection and build a set, I've got to remember how to mix on seven inch how to mix on seven inch i mean i don't know if you mix on seven inch but it's not as easy as 12 inch <laughs> i can totally imagine that <laughs> <laughs> but that but that reinvigorated me again because not only did i go and do that and have a ball and went ah oh, i really like this and also seven inches aren't too heavy you know like a yeah. plate of 12 inches or lps is it was breaking my back it was another reason i went to serato yeah but i thought oh this is a new thing and that just injected me with so much vigor and i started collecting um classic acid house and late mm. 70, uh, late 80s um you know techno on seven inch you know which yeah. was again something no one was doing at that point although p isaac the, one of the other guys in 45 live I, we we found doing a gig that we were literally on the same path and he was like oh, i've been collecting all this stuff and you got this and you got that you know and oh, also wow. it was it was super cheap you know it was all like a quid for those things no one wanted it yeah. was after nobody wanted stage you know no one was after acid house uh so you know went down that avenue and uh you know that invigorated again yeah it's, it, but it's always what's what's next sort of thing and and, and i say you know i'm i'm, I'm intrigued Th these would be like five year stretches between different things mm. you know sort of keep myself I think you've got to keep yourself sharp and you've got to keep yourself on your toes i never wanted to sort of be playing the same old tracks out again and again you know yeah later it doesn't really interest me what what's what's sort of exciting you currently you know about either either kind of like sort of music scene or just kind of generally you, you know sort of in in life as to you, you know what what might be interesting in the kind of culture scene um well it's difficult isn't it because we can't go out half the time <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I love. I love. Just as you think you're about to. I love to go to museums, and I love to see uh, original. I love to see original art, and that can mm. be anything from an original painting, sculpture, to a piece of comic art where you can see all the paste stuff. I just went to see the Beano exhibition at the Somerset House, and you've got all these amazing yeah. Ken Reed page, pages, which are literally like patchwork collages of white out and stuck on bits and. And yeah. bit of color and, and I just absolutely adore seeing the process mm. and getting that close to the artist. You can see the brush marks and things like that, and the pencil marks in the in the in the sides. So yeah. anything like that, I, I really I really love to immerse myself in that. But the thing I'm really excited about at the moment is um I built this uh, turntable last summer, uh, two summers mm. ago actually, with four arms. Four to, well, I think actually we might be able to see it in the corner over there. Yeah, yeah. Got it's it. a well, it's a frame that goes over a turntable and it's got three extra arms. And I've been wanting to do this for ages for a sort of multi-turntable performance, but sort of thought mm. practically about it. If I can take a three arms on a frame, put it onto an existing club turntable, 
plug it into a four channel mixer with an effects box, I can make my own soundscapes. So this is the next sort of project I really want to concentrate on because it, I've always been into turntablism. I've always been into yeah. turntables be my instrument, but I'm, I like the art world and I like mm. dance world, but I want to get somewhere in the middle. Mm. I want to, you know, you can build up, uh, what I'm doing is I'm playing lock grooves, which are just continuous grooves, one on each arm. So you've got four rhythms going at this mm. or ambient sounds, whatever you want to put. Um, and you can very, very quickly build up these, these soundscapes or these rhythm tracks, um, dipping things in and out like you would on a mixing desk uh, in a live situation. And it's really, really interesting for me to do this because I'm traditionally very slow in the studio. You know, I'm very mm. laborious with samples and all these things. And the fact that this is analog, it's hands-on. And um, this is another thing I was doing with Dave, mm. drumming to my turntable experiments and so possibly putting this into a live you know uh, perspective yeah you know literally interacting with a live drummer who's then interacting with what i'm doing is something that really interests me as a sort of someone to take the djing that's not necessarily club based it's, it's mm. pushing myself into an uncomfortable area let's say mm. um, because i can go into a club and i can play a club set or an ambient set or a warm-up set or a closing set, I can I can do that. It's not as easy as riding a bike, but it doesn't push me mentally in the way it used to, you know. And I want to push myself out of my comfort zone into something both technologically new and also it's in that that place that we talked earlier. It's in a, it's yeah. in an area which hasn't been defined. There's yeah. there are sort of areas of sort of turntablism going on outside of the scratch DJ thing, um, which are really, really interesting to me, both visually and technically, but a lot of them concentrate on a very noise based outcome. Mm. I think there can be somewhere rhythmic, somewhere in the middle. And that's I what I would explore. I, I think that's really great. I mean, I, I love that idea and the, and it, you know, and how you, you know that that's out of your comfort zone. I mean, a lot of people talk about, oh, I need to get out of my comfort zone and then never do anything about it. Mm. You know, actually doing it, and it's almost like the the overriding thing for you is to um, challenge yourself. Yeah. Well, well we're, I mean, within pr parameters that I think I can navigate. That you can navigate, yeah. There are parameters here. But also, it's there are parameters as well, and it's quite interesting, I think, always to have parameters because you you kind of creatively box yourself into a, a place and then you try to break out of that mm. when you've got a blank canvas it can be completely overwhelming just overwhelming um and having having guides is 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 a good starting point mm. you know you go into that into that space and you explore it and you you know you push against the edges and you go now what can i do here okay the technology is saying i can only do this but that's, you know, it's the mother of invention, isn't it? You know, when you when you when you're restricted, you know, yeah, like yeah, you know, you, and the cliche of things like Sergeant Pepper, you know, you mm. know what they made with the stuff that they had back then. You know, your phone is more powerful than the stuff they made Sergeant Pepper with. So yeah, I mean, I've I've always sort of wondered about this this um you know about kind of frameworks if you will and, and and kind of boundaries about um whether you know like I, I was sort of classically trained and if, if those those kind of because you have a training that you, mm -hmm. you your mind almost in a way sort of keeps you within those sort of boundaries it's like oh i can't do that because that's not that's not how it should be done then go to the other extreme which is like completely you know as you said blank canvas which is mm. completely overwhelming so how you you kind of get over the to get out of the framework but also not make it so massive that you just can't your brain can't deal with it well it's difficult isn't it when you're classically trained like that i'd imagine not that i am you've got this set of rules and it's the classic sort of having to learn the rules to break the rules sort of thing. yeah Although if you yeah. don't know the rules you completely break them without knowing and maybe make life harder for yourself it's as well but so this is so th this is an interesting one so i did that for for um for moon magazine i did um an interview you might you might have read it with Gemma 
Collingford from Sink Your Teeth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and she said, because she she said, I um I don't want to know the rules because um I'm it, once I know the rules, I don't want to break them. So mm. I so the way that she gets around it says, I don't want to know the rules, then you know, I can kind of discard that part of my brain so I can just go ahead and do whatever. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. like an interesting way to look at it. I mean, it can work for you in some respects, definitely. I mean, I had a situation 10 years ago. I was doing a, um, a series of dome shows to promote the last food album, the search engine. I did a, the, the launch was in the planetarium in Greenwich, um, mm. you know, the, the dome, the planetarium there. And um, we set up this whole thing. Oh, the launch is going to be on this date. Um, you've got to make an audio visual piece with the astronomers. They'll give you some guidance. Yeah. And, some some footage and we'll bring everyone in and they'll we'll have a show and we'll play the album and we'll see this big show on the thing and I'm like great okay right don't know what i'm doing here but they're going to give me some, me some help i've got three months you know two months in probably three weeks away from launch day i'm completely i mean i'm so deep i'm i can barely even see the top of the water i'm i'm i've completely bitten off more than I can chew. I'm going to my my wife. Oh my God, I think I'm going to cancel this. It's so bad. You know, I didn't have the technology. The computer wasn't powerful enough to render the things. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was trying to learn After Effects. Anyway, it happened. It was sketchy as you like, but people came, people enjoyed it. It just about worked. You know, I wasn't super happy with it, but anyway, I did it. And then um, I saw a friend of mine who was big into the dome scene, who I hadn't seen for years and years afterwards uh, at the sort of drinks afterwards. And he said, oh, that was quite impressive because I was wondering how you were going to do a 50 minute show because most people only do five minutes of dome stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and there was me completely not knowing the rules, basically ripping up the rule book. Ripping up the rule book. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I was like, wow, I wish someone had told me that maybe three months ago. <laughs> I might have not had a nervous breakdown nearly trying to get this thing <laughs> off the ground, you know. And, you know, he was kind of impressed by the scope of the ambition. Of the ambition. Because I knew you know better, you know. <laughs> it was, it, it, you know, pulled it off. It's amazing what it's amazing what you can do, you know, when you're put in certain positions. And and there's you know, I think we can see that happening across the world at the moment mm-hmm. with all sorts of things from everything from COVID to, you know, the climate uh situation is that yeah things are ridiculously resourceful when backed into a corner absolutely right kevin brilliant that's taken me to a to a new world it's been really really fantastic talking to you it's um it's amazing to listen to somebody with, with such a kind of like just terrific mindset honestly it's been fantastic i'm glad to uh glad to have been part of it Thanks for listening to the show, and I really hope that you enjoyed it and that you'll tune in for the next episode. In the meantime, it would be really awesome if you could rate and review the show and also share it with any friends who you think might enjoy it.